I'm no good at taking good advice And I'm self-careless, so don't tell me twice That lately I've been so stuck in my head That I forget just about everything my therapist said Maybe I'm self-helpless Maybe I'm self-helpless Maybe I'm self-helpless Maybe we are all self-helpless Hey everyone, welcome to Self-Helpless. I'm Delaney Fisher and I'm joined by Jamie Feinberg who is sharing all about the five years that she lived in an RV and traveled the United States with her husband Ross. This episode was so much fun. Jamie is sharing tons of tips, everything from the first couple steps you can take if you're interested in learning more about this lifestyle, things like what the heck do you do about mail when you live on the road, what kind of jobs her and Ross got that worked well with RV life, how this lifestyle impacted their health and creativity and well-being, the different fun memberships they got while they lived in an RV. I mean, so much good stuff in here. And what I love about Jamie and Ross's story is that they transitioned into RV life did that for five years, and then transitioned out of RV life. So you are getting all the different perspectives and guidance in this episode. And I especially enjoyed hearing about the experiments that they set up for themselves in order to see if it was even possible for them to live in an RV before really committing to this lifestyle. And look, even if you're not wanting the RV life, bus life, van life, tiny home experience, there are so many great takeaways in here for everyone. Not only about things like downsizing, but, you know, prioritization, adaptability, creative solutions, getting unstuck, and also just finding the right balance in your life that works for you and how this looks different for everybody. And how that ideal situation can change and evolve, and that's okay. Just being open to change and adventure was a very cool message from all of this. So please enjoy this freaking lightning bolt of inspiration and motivation. Here's my chat with Jamie. You and your husband lived in an RV for five years and traveled all over the United States. What a cool adventure. I have so many questions, but maybe we can just start with What was going on at the time for both you and your husband when you decided that this is what you wanted to do? Maybe like the jobs that you had, what was the catalyst, anything that you want to share about that time? Absolutely. So we got married in 2014 and it was right around that time that my husband let slip to me. He's, you know, he's a musician and he was teaching. He was um, working at a radio station, public radio, things like that. He admitted that he always wanted to be a touring musician, like since he was in high school and he'd been afraid to do anything about that. But it was just this dream that he'd always had. Now we'd been together for like four and a half years and it just took that long for him to admit this. Wow. Yeah. So my brain heard like three months of build and was like, we have to figure out how to help him <laughs> to realize this dream. How can my husband go be a touring musician? What a supportive partner you are. Because some people are like, okay, dude, you're on your own. <laughs> have fun. Nope, nope. And no, my brain was just like, all right, we got to problem solve this. Like there's got to be a way. So I, you know, I was just really aware, like we kind of needed both of our incomes just to, you know, pay the rent every month. And we didn't have a lot of extra money. I was self-employed. Um, well, partly self-employed in the arts at the time. I also had a full-time job in the arts, which was my first. Um, I was a program manager of the Arts Alliance of Northern New Hampshire. So living up in the mountains, a dream, a dream job when I oh, took wow. it. But also running my own theater company at the same time. Oh my and- gosh, <laughs> you do sound like me. Yeah. <laughs> three jobs, three <laughs> different careers at once. No big deal. <laughs> yeah. So um, so as we're like living our lives, he admits he has this dream. And I'm like, okay, how do we do this? And financially, it's very clear to me without even crunching any numbers. Like, I can't just send him to, like, go travel. Like, we don't have that extra income. Yeah. So I'm thinking, yeah, do we, like, get a van? Do we get an RV? Like, what can we even do? And I was just like, we don't have a lot of money. Like, how do we do this? And we didn't, I didn't want it to be something we did in 15 years, right? I wanted to support him to be able to do it quickly. Yeah. And then I literally had a dream. So like literally (gasps) in my sleep, I have a dream and in the dream, I have the idea to buy a used RV 
and travel the country with me. Oh my gosh. Oh, I have chills. This is so good. (laughs) (laughs) So yeah, so I wake up and I nudge him and I'm like, hey, (laughs) what about this? I just had this dream. And he was like, yeah, sounds great. You know, he rolls over and goes back to sleep. And basically I get to work. And in less than a year and a half, we had bought the RV that was roadworthy and we started traveling the country. And it also was realizing this other thing that we both were aware of, which was, As much as we loved a lot of things about where we were living and what we were doing, we didn't see ourselves living in New Hampshire for the rest of our lives, Mm -hmm. and we didn't really know where we wanted to be. So I figured this trip, traveling together, we could like scout out all these different places and figure out where we actually wanted to settle down. Because my husband writes his own music, it's like very quirky, it doesn't fit into categories very well. Um, His name's Ross Malcolm Boyd, he does like quirky indie rock kind of. Basically, yeah, he he would have a hard time in New Hampshire finding music scenes or in even in Boston, there were little pockets, but it was hard to find places that were going to be really into his music. And we knew that if we were going to live somewhere, we wanted there to be a music community that was mm. super on board with what he does. They didn't need to be le- just like him, but they needed to be supportive, you know, having that kind of in his yes. hometown was important. So that was one of the things that we had in our minds when we started traveling it's like okay where do we want to live someday and like where where are the good music scenes that would be good specifically for him so smart this adventure that you both took took so many boxes for you both and can I just say I love the fact that when he told you this dream and he you know took him four and a half years to work up the courage instead of your default being no which is very you know common with uncertain things like no thanks. We're, we're surviving the way we're we're doing it now. You went to how, and I love that that was your response because it opens up this whole new world of potential and possibilities for you both. And I just think that's really cool. So it seems very overwhelming to think about the to-do list of preparing for something like this, everything from downsizing, maybe finding remote work, I'd assume, getting the RV and any supplies, learning about everything. So what were your very first steps um, for preparation and planning? The very first thing I did was pop online and start researching because when I had this dream, I didn't even know that there were other people doing this, like living full time in an RV while they were still working age. You know, it was it was 2014, right? So now, like, oh my gosh, right, RV a decade life ago, kind of taken over. Wow, <laughs> that dream really came from your inner self, then, not like, oh, I saw this on Instagram a million times. That is wild. And I got to say, I've interviewed so many people at this point. I've been doing this almost eight years. I can't tell you how many times somebody will have a dream and that's what sparks, you know, a business or an adventure or some incredible change in their life. So anyway, I just think this is so, so neat that you allowed yourself to follow the dream. Yeah, that's absolutely. And that is so cool that you've heard, heard the dream, like as a part of it. I love that. So we like, I or no, not even we, it was me, like 95% <laughs> of the work of all this. It was me. Like my husband is amazing at a lot of things, but planning something like this was like not in his real health, but he was happy to go along for the ride and grateful for the opportunity. So yeah. yeah so I started researching, um, I was thinking about who I found like very quickly, just like quick Google. Um, they're, they're, they're bloggers, they're still blogging, they're still full-time uh, RVers and boaters. Wow. Technomadia oh, is their names. And they had already been doing it for, I think, at least five years prior, maybe more, it might've been 10 wow. by that point. And they had documented everything. So it was like, this is how we handle our mail, right? Like, this is what we do with banking and with health oh, insurance and gosh. like all of the pieces. Things I wouldn't even think about, yes. Mail, oh my goodness. <gasps> yeah, the other, the other blogger I immediately went uh immediately discovered was called wheeling it and they do still blog occasionally um but they i think they did probably 10 years on the road or something so um similarly they kind of just mapped out their travels all across the united states and these are the kinds of things that we're dealing with and they would share resources when i found them too so that showed me okay there are other people that are doing this They're not much older than me and they're not like independently wealthy. (laughs) Yeah. They're, you know, they're sharing what they're doing. Um, And, and that kind of led me into all the different communities that did exist. Cause yeah, it turns out there, there were 
certainly other people who had done it before. Um, so that was super, super helpful, just kind of doing all that research. And then I also did simultaneous research about like, okay, what's, what's even available for like a use of the, right? Like, yeah. So what's available for me locally? Ultimately, we ended up going to Massachusetts. There seemed to be like a, a bigger market of RVs there. So just, um, you know, we went to a, an RV show so we could just tour a bunch of RVs, right? Because oh, nice. like, what happens if you buy an RV and it turns out you're like, oh, I couldn't even live in this thing, right? So yeah. um, just getting a sense of what's it going to be like. Um, and you mentioned downsizing, like that was really huge for us. Mm-hmm. Um, we, even though we lived in a not very large two bedroom apartment, we'd both been in situations where our family had lots of room for storage. So we had, neither of us had been forced to get rid of stuff. So we both had like all this childhood stuff that, you know, just bins of things that we hadn't gone through. It was kind yeah. of absurd. And we were like, if we're going to be traveling the road, we don't want to be like dealing with all this plus like where are we going to put it how much are we going to pay to store it somewhere or how many family members are we going to piss off because (laughs) you know our stuff is just taking up their space those damn RVers (laughs) exactly so downsizing was something we got really serious about and Mm. we didn't initially tell our families we wanted to have some real concrete plans before we kind of scared them and we're like hey by the way giving up our job (laughs) gotta figure it out traveling the country yeah. Um, so before we did that, we basically said, we've decided that we no longer want to receive physical gifts, or at least not, um, like, you know, you can give us food, right? Or you can give us like memberships to places or things like that. But we set that expectation up so we would stop accumulating stuff. Right. And uh, so we had some family members that was pretty challenging for, but you know, basically we framed it as, we don't know when, but we've been thinking like the tiny house thing for a while, which was true. The only house we had ever looked at was actually a tiny house and that hadn't worked out. But we, we were thinking tiny already. But the thing we didn't mention was we're thinking tiny on wheels. <laughs> so, <laughs> it's a little different. No big deal. <laughs> yeah, yeah. And then we actually started restricting how we lived in our apartment because my husband especially was kind of like, Am I going to be dealing with claustrophobia in this really small space? Mm. Um, so we wanted to get used to it. So what we did was we made our second bedroom off limits. We made our living room off limits. <gasps> and we just forced ourselves to live in our kitchen, like kind of an open kitchen. It didn't have like a dining room or anything. And our bedroom, which was a huge bedroom. And figured, okay, if we can keep ourselves to these spaces, it won't be that much different. If we live in a, you know, in a small RV and we ended up eventually purchasing a 25 foot RV. So that was like pretty good guess. Oh my gosh. I love that experiment. How brilliant. I mean, it reminds me a lot about, you know, the, the tips around downsizing your stuff, even if you're not moving into an RV, right? Like pack everything away for a few months, see what you actually need, only take things out as you need them, all that stuff. I, I love a good experiment. So when it came down to actually moving your stuff in, what did you decide to take and leave behind and maybe store at families? I mean, I, I imagine you took a lot of the functional things, but what about like all the clothing that you like and you only have room for some of it? How did you make those types of decisions, those micro decisions? Yeah, it was it was tricky. I think I had read a lot from other RVers talking about how brutal commercial washing machines are on clothing. Mm. So a lot of the decision I made was if there's, if I have a few items that are super precious to me, so I don't want to get rid of them. Like those are the ones that are going to, I'm going to keep and I'm going to find a way to store them somehow. And then I got rid of anything I wasn't like totally in love with for obvious reasons and trying to think about all seasons and like how minimalist can we be thinking about how things can coordinate together. Um, But yeah, making sure I wasn't traveling with anything you know, like we're going to be camping, right? Like the plan was, you know, we're at a campground or something like you don't want to be, you know, in your, your fancy prom dress. Uh, Or at least I didn't want to be in my fancy prom dress. (laughs) Sure. sure. I'm sure it's for somebody out there. Yeah. (laughs) (laughs) So yeah, you think about like kind of the dirty work of a campground and initially in our first two years, part of the year, we actually worked at campgrounds. So we did like, activities directors and recreation directors and things like that and actually my our very first experience living at a campground we hadn't even left New Hampshire yet so we bought the RV and we made a trade with a campground in New Hampshire so we were putting in hours there to pay our rent for like four months or something like that so it, you know I was even 
I was even cleaning bathrooms one day a week as part of that job, right? Yeah. So like, these are clothes that are <laughs> your dirty clothes. Like that was a lot of what we needed. There was no need for office clothes. Any office attire, I basically was like, never again. Like, <laughs> yeah, I'm letting that go. I'll deal with that. Like, if I'm ever back in an office, I'll find the right stuff, right? But I don't need that right now. Yeah. Oh my gosh. Okay. So let's talk about, and I know people are going to have this question, um, especially people who are interested in making this change to this type of lifestyle. What, how did you ease out of the jobs that you had and into this other work, that transition of really making that final call of like, okay, it's time. This is my last day. And now we're doing this and we're going to see what happens. What was all that like? So because of the particular job that I was in as the program manager for the Arts Alliance, I knew they needed plenty of heads up. It was basically a two-person organization, like two-person plus a very part-time bookkeeper. Okay. So I gave them a couple months notice. And what I ended up doing is I got a job at a summer stock theater company in New Hampshire for the summer um, and maybe into the early fall. I don't remember the exact details. And I got a job for my husband there as well. So he oh, got wow. to be he got to be a professional musician playing the season, which he had never done before. He was super excited oh about gosh, that to do that cool. with theater. Wow. Yeah. And it was something I had done like way back. So for me, my very early career was in professional theater. So it was totally in my skill set. And I had made a pivot to doing amateur and educational theater. But the reason we took this job was because it would give us a chance to try out our being get like basically before we left New Hampshire, work out the kinks of living in an RV and figuring yeah. that out. And I figured it would be less stressful for me to do it in like, like a type of work that I could just, I could just do without thinking about it rather yes. than the like really hands-on, just really important kind of stuff that I was doing as a program manager. I just did all the things. So we really lucked into that, but like it all kind of came together it, it was a bit of a brain break because, you know, I was getting a little bit burnt out from the position that I was in. Mm. So that was our initial transition moment. And meanwhile, my husband had a teaching studio in that same location. So it also gave us a little bit of extra time for him to wrap up with his students and give notice to them and clean up his office and all of that. So that kind of, that was like our transition. And we finally left New Hampshire in October. And we, we've been doing work to book gigs of course that was the idea right he yeah. wants to be a touring musician travel the country and turned out when you don't have a big like online following or anything like that booking gigs is really challenging um right. and I had to get really creative about researching venues there are a lot of places that you know be like maybe they have a Facebook page or maybe somebody refers to them somewhere and you find a phone number you know because yeah. like not everywhere now. I mean, now I think probably most of those places would have a big social media presence, but they didn't necessarily. <laughs> when we were doing this, we left in 2016. That was a lot harder than we thought. Um, most of our music students, Ross, I mentioned Ross's teaching studio, studio, and most of his students and a few people who'd worked with me wanted to keep working with us. So when oh, we left, nice. we were like, all right, we got some bookings lined up and then we got some income that we'll make on the road, but it wasn't very much. And, you know, we had saved up as much money as we could. I didn't even mention like when I sat down and crunched numbers, I was like, oh my gosh, we're actually losing a little bit of money every month. How is that even happening? Whoa. So I, we also had to cut our budget way back. And I took on another job, which is wild because I was also running my theater company, right? But I took on I took on a part-time job as a church musician, which is something I had done in the past. I just hadn't been doing it for the past year, year and a half. So basically all the money I made working for the church went straight into the bank. So that's how we were able to really build up a good nest egg and know that we were actually making money and not just maybe <laughs> paying you even, which is where we somehow were. It's amazing how you can spend money when you're not paying really close attention to it. So by the time we left, we had enough money that we could travel. I figured we could travel for at least like three months before we needed to panic. Um, and that ended up like that was pretty accurate. So basically, we just we watched what we were doing with the understanding that like, we're going to have to stop and pick up work if like the bookings don't pick up or other things don't pick up. Yeah. Um, so that was it initially. And then I started building a virtual assistant business. I didn't have a name for it at the time. I didn't know that was what people called it. But I started reaching out to, to past clients that I'd worked with because um, I'd worked with them online. So it was like yeah. I got all the skills that I could be doing 
So I started building that. And, you know, my husband, because he's an audio engineer, we started realizing, oh, like podcast editing might be a thing, or he's got video editing skills. And I'm, I love to write. I did, I started a blog, like, as soon as we decided we were going to do this, it was private at first, but then I made it public, of course, when our plans became public. So I ended up doing some professional writing, like, you know, travel writing as we got going. So I wanted to be a writer, like back when I was like eight or something. So it was like, ooh, <laughs> I'm a professional <laughs> yes, writer. Dream fulfilled. Cool. Yes. <laughs> oh my gosh. Okay. I really want to highlight this for a second. The fact that when people think about making a change like this, it's very easy to get overwhelmed where it has to be like all or nothing. Like you change your life overnight from this to that. And I love the fact that you set up these experiments for yourselves where, okay, you're living in your apartment a certain way. Then you're actually living in the RV, but you, you're not on the road quite yet. And you're working out the kinks there. All of these very intentional steps that you took, um, I think are so cool and important for people to hear, knowing that you can ease out of your old life and into your new life and they overlap. And it doesn't have to be this big, huge transition overnight. You can give yourself that time. Also, very cool that you basically became your husband's tour manager. <laughs> it sounds like like <laughs> you had a lot, a lot of yeah, different things going am. on. Yeah. <laughs> and I also love the fact that you both kind of thought about, okay, what skills do we both have that we could leverage to fuel this uh, life on the road with podcasts and video editing and writing and virtual assisting and all that kind of stuff while you're working, also working towards a different dream of, you know, full-time musician and all that stuff. So anyway, the intentional steps that you took, a lot of people can learn from, and it's just really, really inspiring. Everything that you said about some of the, the logistics and challenges made me think of a bunch of more questions for you. So what did you do about things like mail? and health insurance and, and those types of things that people might not be thinking about. Anything that you want to share around those types of tips? So when we started RVing, there were really only three states that RVers were basing themselves in because of those kinds of things. And mm. if you were like us and you were working and you were self-employed, the only option we had for health insurance was to be Florida residents and get a plan through Florida Blue. I think they had two options. Whoa. That was it. So when we learned that, it was like, okay, yeah. well, the option's clear. Like, we know we need health insurance. I had I had enough kind of stuff in my background to be like, I need health insurance. And, you know, at this point, we're both 30. Like, we're not, we're not 20. We're not just going to chance it and hope for the best, especially yeah. where we didn't have, like, a big nest egg if we had to pay for stuff. And you know how expensive health care is in the United States. Right. So... <laughs> Yep, yep. So we became Florida residents and Florida still actually makes it quite easy to be a Florida resident, but be traveling. So mm. at least at the time, and I think this is still true, it was like you had to had to get your license and everything. And then I think you had to get your, your vehicle inspected once every seven years and come back to the state once every seven years. Oh, so not too, too bad. It's really not. I mean, so many oh. places, it's like, you've got to be back in the state every year. Otherwise, you can't re renew, renew stuff. Yeah. Um, some of them, maybe you've got like a year or two extra, you know, if you submit stuff by mail or things like that. So that decision was made based on health insurance. The mail thing, I did some research. And again, I had the advantage of like those blogs I mentioned that talked about what they did. And I went with, St. Brendan's Isle, which is really popular with RVers and with boaters, but there are a lot of other good options too. Um, we actually still use them. So we've still got still got mail coming to our Florida address and they're just, they make it really easy to just Amazing. handle everything online. So oh. yeah, like those are like the big things that people always talk about is where, where do you get your mail? Where does your health insurance come from? Absolutely. Yes. Oh my gosh. Such great tips. That is so, just so fascinating. All of this. I think that this lifestyle can now, nowadays be kind of glorified online or on social media, right? And I'm sure it's incredible in so many ways, but I'm sure there's also a lot of challenges that people should know before pursuing something like this. So anything about actually being on the road, whether it was it was hard to find internet places or like, you know, how to get the van cleaned or whatever, anything that you might want to share about, okay, here's what you really need to know when you pursue something like this. The internet thing was definitely a big question. Um, Technomadia, because they were techies, they had really robust internet solutions and now like they actually have 
a website, I think it's called like mobile internet, something or other resource center or something along those lines. Yeah. And that's like, that's, a, that's their business, right? So wow. they're an amazing resource. So yeah, when we started, I think we both had Verizon because it had the best service in the places that we were at. And then we hit a certain spot in Texas where we didn't have any cell phone service for like a thousand miles. <laughs> and we we're like, oh my God. this isn't sustainable. Oh, so wow. yeah, as soon as we got to our next big city, I switched, uh, I switched to T-Mobile, which made sense again like Technomadia had talked about it so it was like all right fin- uh, financially and also in terms of the service now we have two different carriers so we're going to have different coverage etc um and then i think we picked up a booster somewhere along the way so we we did the slow approach of like when we needed it when it, we didn't have enough for teaching when we didn't have enough of a signal then we would do that sometimes we were able to like go to a big box store parking lot and pick up their wi-fi and teach a lesson there and that helped uh, some libraries had amazing um, internet, mm. but yeah, you 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 know we figured out stuff along the way, and we didn't have unlimited options, right? So we had to learn how to conserve. The majority of what we were doing had to go towards things like teaching and coaching that involved a lot of data because yeah. that was our livelihood. Right. So you know some of the apps that existed it'd be like oh we can download netflix right or we can download amazon prime or whatever things we had like that um disney plus um when we had free internet and then we would have it on our devices so now you know we can watch watch some episodes of the tv or watch a movie or things like that so you can learn to get creative about that kind of stuff oh so interesting so did you find once you were actually living on the road, did you find that it was less expensive, more expensive, kind of a wash versus if you were like paying rent in an apartment somewhere or whatever it was? What let's talk about maybe the expenses a little bit that go into it, maybe hidden ones too that people might not be thinking about. We definitely kept our expenses, I would say, on the lower side compared okay. to a lot of years. So at the time, like before we hit the road, I had started something that called the autoimmune protocol to get to the bottom of some health issues. Okay. So that meant that basically I couldn't walk into a restaurant unless I was going to be like, you know, what oil do you use? And I can't eat these vegetables, but I can eat these ones. I mean, it was that particular. Right. So basically, we did all of our own cooking. Okay. And then as I kind of progressed with this um, elimination diet and was able to add foods back in, then we were able to eat out more. But because of our budget, we didn't eat out very often. So it was definitely a treat. Mostly we cooked our own stuff. Um, both know how to cook. My husband's an amazing cook. We did fine. And then I love ice cream. So that kind of became the way that we were foodies on the road. So we would look okay. for like fancy homemade ice cream places. And that was a way for us to experience things affordably. Also got really good at just like, what are the free experiences in this place that we can experience or what's, you know, you just, you figure out the apps and you figure out what terms to Google right. and, and it becomes some of the fun of it to be like, you know, how, how can we really affordably get to know this place? And for us, part of the joy of our being was figuring out, like, if we lived here, like what supermarket would we go to? What would we do in our free time? Like, right. Where some people are going to be like, I want to just see the national parks, right? Like, some people are were looking for different things and we did some of that, but mostly we were thinking like, you know, where would we want to live and, yeah. you know, where can we go for live music and like all those kinds of things. Amazing. So it's really like, what are your priorities? I love the fact that you were able to explore all of these different locations. So there was always a plan of, okay, at some point we're going to be done with the RV life and we're going to want to settle in somewhere or we'll just live in an RV in the state or city that we like. And I have a lot of questions about how you transitioned out of RV life. But before we get into that, what are some of the really fun or special or spontaneous moments that you two had together because of this lifestyle that you know that you wouldn't have had in a conventional lifestyle situation? There is so much fun that we had. Um, I bet. So I mentioned, I mentioned we worked at campground some and I would say generally like the working at the campgrounds wasn't the most fun part, but we met some of the most amazing people. So like we threw parties with all these people that we got to work with. Um, when we were activities directors, like we got to create 
workshops and classes on whatever we wanted, which was super fun. Mm -hmm. So like my husband like did a songwriting songwriting class and you know he did one of the like um one of the art classes where you know he had painted a thing and then he taught people how to paint the thing, you know. Um Yes, so fun. <laughs> so so that was special, like just I created a solar system through the campground. Like there was one week where like that was one of the activities. So I had like out of hula hoops and stuff like that, I made like all these different planets and then like people <laughs> buy them and learn about the planets I mean it was like the sky is the limit in terms of your yeah. creativity so I think like, that was that was super fun um we fell completely in love with New Mexico so ah, we, oh, every, I really like, want to go there it's places, on my list <laughs> oh my it is an absolute must visit there are so many amazing places we like every place we were in in New Mexico we were in love with Albuquerque ultimately we were there for eight months before we stopped traveling so we obviously like we, we thought we'd be there a month and we just wow. we didn't leave because we were totally in love with it. But yeah, we have a lot of memories of places there. One of the favorite places we found in Albuquerque, we spent so much time at the Botanical Garden. You know, when you've got a membership to a place like that, you know, you learn every nook and cranny. So that was really fun. The Arizona Sonora Desert Museum in Tucson, we refer to it as like Disney World of the Southwest. There's like so many different things at this place. We got memberships there too and absolutely loved it. We became Disney season pass holders because we were Florida residents. We could get them oh, really cheaply. So right, we spent right. big chunks of time in, you know, in the Orlando area and like, you know, months at a time where we would go to Disney like two or three times a week. Yeah. So you just like have dinner, finish your work for the day and then go like eat popcorn and walk around Epcot or something. <laughs> oh my gosh. So much fun. And how did you both feel like if you could give us kind of a before and after snapshot of when you were, you know, living more conventionally and now you're living on the road, what did it feel like to maybe be more creative or be in nature more or did you find that it really impacted your mental health or well-being or any anything that you were surprised by or anything like that my health got so much better when we started traveling I think it was like this giant weight that was lifted and you know I I started my personal development journey like probably a year into our travel so it was like I had kind of even resisted doing that kind of work. Like when people talked about it, I felt like I kind of laughed at it and I didn't really take it seriously. But then when I had like space and free time, I was more open to stuff and I started hearing things and then reading things. Yeah. And I started to realize I'd been dealing with anxiety my whole life. Nobody had ever diagnosed it as anxiety. Um, The period of time in high school or when I'd gone into therapy, they talked about it as like depression. Mm. But I, I know now, like, with reflection, it was anxiety that I carried and called being busy my whole life. Uh, so yeah. So when I no longer had all these things, and to be fair, like most of the things in my life, these were self-imposed things, right? Like I was self-employed in the arts. I had my own theater company. I was doing all these things that I loved, but I never really stopped to pause and recognize that my body was suffering the consequences of how much I was doing. Yeah. And you know, I, I never said no to anything. It was just do all the things. And part of it was because I, most of my career, I was self-employed living in New Hampshire, which is challenging because I was driving all over this state to have enough work to be self-employed in the arts. Whereas if I'd been like in a big city, I probably could have just hopped on a train and like, you know, been really close to all the things, but instead I was driving all over the state um, and putting in tons of hours. It was really really rough on my body and so I got this reset when we started traveling in the RV and yes there were stresses there were things that popped up you know we had panic moments with money where like we had wanted to go visit my sister um, who was living in San Diego at the time and we were in Arizona and I'm crunching numbers and I'm going if we go to San Diego I don't think we're gonna be able to get to Florida which is where we need to get to become residents and buy our our vehicle right so stuff like that you know was a reality check or whatever like that was stressful um but overall I was so much less stressed and I was going out and you know walking for an hour like in nature sometimes two hours you know in a day and just the freedom to do that was huge my husband too had when he had had more conventional jobs he'd always 
struggled with them. Like he really, he's somebody who should be working, you know, working in the arts, like diving deeply into a project, that kind of a thing. Yeah. He's really great at that. But dealing with the, the rest of the logistics um, that pop up in life can be really challenging for him. And to have a break from a lot of that stuff and just be doing the work that we were choosing. And yes, sometimes we took breaks where we were working at a campground and maybe doing less ideal stuff. But there was always so much fun in our, you know, in our every week. Like there was so much that we got to do. And we were really good about doing that. You know, we never just, we never just stayed in those tiny walls. Like you don't want to, right? Like we were in a 25 foot space. We wanted to get out and see all the things wherever we were. So we did. And it yeah, it just made such a difference. When we started, we were like, oh, we'll do this for at least a year and then we'll reevaluate at the one year mark. And we were thinking maybe one to five years, but yeah, ultimately it was five years for us before that equation shifted. And we knew we knew probably after our first year, definitely our second year, that we didn't want to go back to conventional jobs, at least not if we could help it. Like it was right. just like the lifestyle shift was so amazing that it was like, now if we go back and we take work somewhere, it's going to need to fit our lifestyle. We're not just going to yeah, assume, you know, assume that we're going to go back to what, what we were in before. Cause it, it wasn't as healthy for us. Like we got a taste yeah. of what was possible. Exactly. It would be so hard to go back after that. And I would imagine living on the road for five years really makes you adaptable you know, to (laughs) challenges and, uh, you know, things that pop up and everything. You mentioned that you had originally planned to just stop in New Mexico, but you stayed there for like eight months, right? Is there anything else that happened like that where you had a plan and the plan changed either because you were enjoying a certain place or something happened and you had to pivot? Any other experiences like that? Well, there are always experiences in an RV where something breaks down that you were not <laughs> imagine. Like yeah. your house on wheels, there's just always something breaking. So sometimes it's something really minor, you know, like, oh, your cup holder broke. Okay. You can, yeah. you can make do without that cup holder. You liked it, but you'll be fine. But then there were other times that, you know, like my husband once was on the highway. Um, I had gone ahead to the winery that we were staying at. Um, we had a Harvest Host membership. Um, so we could, parked at wineries and places like that. So I had gone ahead. I had, I think I'd even bought some wine and I was like settled in the car, just waiting for him to come with the RV at like his like RV pace basically. And um, yeah, I got a call from him that he was stuck on the side of the road. And, mm. you know, so he had called a tow for a tow truck and yeah. yeah. So things like that would happen. You know, we were leaving, I can remember leaving, I think Washington state with, Um, We stayed with his family and we were on our way out of town and all of a sudden we've got a check engine light and a noise that we don't like. And it's like, all right, you know, so you just always, we would build in a lot of extra time and there's always a degree of flexibility. You know, you never, you never just assume you're not going to have any issues from here to there because oftentimes you will. Speaking of New Mexico, there was one time we were driving through New Mexico it's Colorado and I didn't realize they get wind warnings like really intense wind warnings oh, in New yeah. Mexico because of how high the winds get so like we we had to pull over at a gas station in the middle of nowhere um because they had like 60 70 mile per hour winds and oh, it was like geez. it's not safe for us to drive so yeah we unexpectedly like parked ourselves for the night and had to stay put and then we just like checked in to update the campground that was expecting us, you know, like, okay, so this is going to bump us back a little bit. We'll probably be arriving on this day instead, but you know, we built an extra time and it was fine, but yeah, it's pretty scary when you're in this really high profile vehicle and it's just shaking and rattling. And you're like thinking about, am I at the right angle? Am I at the best angle for us to be safe in this? Like, right. That would be a little nerve wracking for sure. Um, So five years go by and somehow along the road, pun intended, you both decided that it was time to leave RV life and do something else. So what was happening around that time? And what was the transition like? Did you start living in one of the places that you explored? Uh, Tell us where you're kind of at now and what that transition was like. I think it was probably fall of 2019 where I found myself slowing down in terms of like, I was no longer super energized by planning out all the travel and all this stuff. Yeah. Um, So I, I was craving like less of that. And it was coinciding with my virtual assistant business had totally taken off. 
So I was putting in big time hours in that business. It was all going really well, but I, um, I was actually asking my husband to take on more responsibilities like around the RV, which sounds silly when I say it, cause like how much is there, but he took on like more mm. cooking and things like that because yeah. I was just so busy. And, you know, we've always had that give and take in our relationship, like one or the other's doing better, you know, and the other one supports them in different ways. So it wasn't that big of a thing, but we had to have that conversation. So yeah, I I was finding what had been really joyful for me, I'd gotten so much pleasure from the trip planning as much as I had the actual doing, it was starting to feel like a burden. So that started having us go, okay, maybe we need to stay put for longer. Maybe we need to start to find find that community. We've tried out a few places, maybe, maybe give it, you know, like give it a longer go. Like one of the conversations we were having is like, does Colorado have too much winter? Like, could we do mm-hmm. a winter in an RV, which is obviously less than ideal, but could we do that to like try out a community in Colorado? Mm-hmm. Um, which we didn't rule out, but turns out like if you have an RV in Colorado, it's really hard to get a campsite. So <laughs> <laughs> that oh, was more challenging. Interesting. Yeah, like it's a really desirable place to see. One of the communities that was on our list was Orlando. So we made our way to Orlando in late 2019. Again, we picked up another uh, another set of season passes because we were going to be near <laughs> Disney and we're like, this would be fun. <laughs> So we like revisited all of our favorite places. It, it was so funny. Like our whole, we were not Disney people before we were gifted, uh, gifted a trip there for a week by my husband's sister, but we fell so hard for it. So it was, so it was really fun when we got <laughs> to get season passes. But anyway, so we did that for a few months um, and Orlando like was treating us pretty well. We got way more gigs than we had our last time in town. We had gigs booked out through August. Um, you know, we like my husband really enjoyed the music scene in Orlando. It was going really well. And then of course, uh, March, 2020. So, oh, oh my pandemic. goodness. Yes. Yeah. <laughs> Holy shit. When that happened, that really shifted like everything because we lost all of our gigs. And actually, I said we booked through August, but we actually had work booked into the fall back in New Hampshire. We were planning to go back for a couple months and do some teaching artist work and all of that fell through as well. Oh, wow. So all of those things, like all the music stuff, like the things that my husband finds like most fulfilling in the world, all of that went away. And at the same time, we were also super prepared for it because we were used to just like kind of doing our own thing. Right. That's what I was going to say. It's like kind of a great situation, but also challenging because you are together in a tiny space, but you're also away from people. I mean, I don't know. It's very interesting. It was strange. Like it was a real period of challenge and depression, especially for my husband. I did better at it. Um, I, you know, I, I was very deliberate about like connecting with family and friends and things. And actually because we've been traveling, it, the pandemic meant people were more receptive to like doing a zoom call with us to like mm-hmm. making more meaningful connections than they would have been because they didn't have any other options because they right. couldn't just like go down the road and see a movie or whatever. Right. So um, I did better with it than my husband did. But at the same time, we also like we did courses and we spoke to people about like, how do you live with your partner in a small space? Or what does, you know, what does it look like to live in an RV and travel? Because people got really interested in that in the pandemic, too, when they started to get, uh, you know, like anxious, like they wanted to go do something, right? So it was this funny, this funny, like pluses and minuses of the situation. And we were based at this park right near, right near the Disney park outside of Orlando. And, you know, the way the pandemic was handled there was not comfortable for us. Like, You know, we were the weirdos if we wore a mask. We basically had everything delivered to our campground, you know, before they ever had vaccines or anything like that. We just like avoided buildings. <laughs> and we had the luxury that we could do that. We were in a place where that was actually possible. So we were grateful for that. But at a certain point, when the Disney park started opening again, we were like, why are we still here? Because we're not comfortable yet. Yeah. We don't have vaccines. We're not comfortable going in business businesses. We're not comfortable visiting the park. So that's when we were thinking, okay, maybe we go to Colorado or we go to New Mexico because these are like places that we really love. They've been on the list of places we might want to settle down. And ultimately, New Mexico, like I said, I couldn't find a good place for us for the winter in Colorado. So we said, okay, we'll do New Mexico. 
And we figured there's so much outdoor space there, it would be a good place to be in the pandemic. Because even if we can't, you know, even if we're masking everywhere, even if a lot of businesses like museums and stuff are still closed, which they were when we first got there, there was still plenty of stuff that we could do out in nature to not feel trapped. So yeah, we went to Albuquerque for a month. We had friends there that we had met our being and we visited with them a little bit socially distance outside mask the whole thing and yeah. uh and then we just felt so hard for Albuquerque in our one month there that we extended our stay and extended our stay and ultimately we're like let's see what winter in Albuquerque is like like it's going to be colder than we thought because we thought we we're going to go to southern New Mexico yeah. but you know it's so tolerable when you have winter in Albuquerque like if it snows one day then it melts within a day or two Oh, and wow. you know you're back to like 40s 50s so you know you wear a warm coat or whatever you're totally fine that's how we did that um and it was while we were there that with the political environment and everything else um we were starting to get worried about if we were going to be able to stay self-employed and doing this lifestyle because mm-hmm. we were so reliant on health insurance and the yeah. threat was there that, you know, Obamacare might go away, right? Like we might not have an affordable health insurance option. Right. So when we were thinking about that and also thinking about the threat to, um, you know, reproductive rights and all that stuff, which also mm-hmm. was definitely a concern. Then we were like, well, we've talked about Canada. <laughs> ah. So maybe... Here we are, you know, here we were thinking New Mexico is amazing. And honestly, if it weren't for all that stuff, I think we would still be in New Mexico. I don't think we ever would have left. Um, But with those factors, we we were like, let's look at Canada. And that's, you know, that ended up being like a viable option for us. Um, So my husband applied to some schools to go back to school. He had an associate's degree, but didn't have a bachelor's. And he'd been teaching music for like 15 plus years privately but he never taught in a classroom and there's a really high demand for teachers here wow so, so you ended up in Canada and it turns out he was so, yeah in wow. Canada, and he was so excited like just like the dream that he like hadn't said anything about I don't think this was something he consciously had thought of but oh my gosh he was so excited when we started looking into schools and the fact that he could go back to school he was absolutely thrilled about it yeah so that's yeah that's what we did so applied to some schools gosh. he didn't uh he ha- he's a guitarist, but he had never studied classical guitar. And the school that he chose, he would need to study classical guitar. So <laughs> my amazingly talented husband, like we bought him a classical guitar. He had three lessons online with a teacher that we know who was super kind to work with him. And then he like submitted his audition and got a big scholarship. <laughs> oh my gosh. Now we're in Canada. Oh. So. <laughs> wow. What a journey. And so when you made that transition or transition back into this kind of day to day, what kind of values or things did you take with you from RV life? Like, is did you find a happy medium for for yourself? It's not too conventional, but it's not too unconventional. What is that middle ground for both of you now? One thing I definitely think we took with us is we are much more minimalist. We're so thoughtful about bringing anything into our space, yeah. which has been really cool. In the RV, a lot of our viewers will say like they have a one in one out policy. So if you discover something that you have to have in your RV, then you have to find something else to let go because yeah. there's only so much space. And that's definitely affected us. And, you know, I'm really big about like the environmental impact of the purchases we make. So we do a lot of thrifting and things like that. So, you know, when we when we outfitted like the room that I'm in, it was a very step by step process of like what's the real right thing for this space? Right. And, you know, we might have to be looking for it for months, right? To like see the right thing. But then when we see it, we know it, we've like really thought about it and been intentional. So that's something that stuck with us. From a career standpoint, we're still kind of piecemealing different things right now. Mm So we're both doing performing arts work. We're both performers. I, I direct a chorus here now, which is super fun. Oh, cool. Um, it's awesome. Uh, it's, it's barbershop. I don't know if <laughs> you know barbershop music, like in picture, like for like old tiny dudes um, in, in uh, like stripes or whatever. Oh like, my gosh. Really incredible. Old, tiny barbershop. <laughs> so cool. <laughs> I do that kind of music with, with a chorus of women, wow. um, which is amazing. And then, yeah, I, I started coaching I started getting asked to coach people in 2019 
Um, and then it started, I studied up on it and started charging people in 2020 yeah. because people get really inspired by the way we've lived our lives and they want help creating lives that they love too. Yeah. So it's been amazing to support people in that, um, especially because I'm child free. A lot of child free women find me or child free people find me. We seem to have a lot in common that way, but I've worked with people in all phases of life, like probably from like 25 through, you know, people in their seventies who are inspired by my story and want to figure out what that their what their version is, right? Like what tweaks can they make in their own life to find more joy? I mean, you're living what you teach, right? Like you're, you're walking the talk. So of course people are drawn to you to learn from how you, how you've done all this and navigated all this. Let's say that somebody's tuning in right now who really is interested in um, RV life or something, bus life, van life, whatever it might be. Any advice for them if they're feeling a little bit overwhelmed on where to start? And then where can people find you if um, if you don't mind them connecting with you further or any other resources that you might want to plug? Absolutely. So yeah, if if you're getting started, I would definitely try to try to tour or check out vehicles that are the kind of thing that you're interested in mm-hmm. to get a clear sense of like, could I live in a van or does it need to be an RV? And then like, right. what would that look like? Get real clear on what you've got to work with in terms of resources, like from a financial standpoint, but I would say start with figuring out the dream piece of it first and then start to go there. Because if you get really clear first on like, okay, this is what I need to be comfortable. This is what I need to make this work. Then, you know, maybe you put things off for a year or two so that you can build up your income to make that feasible. What you don't want to do is like hop into something because you know, you have this idea, but it's not fully fleshed out. And then it turns out it's not quite the right thing. Right. That's definitely important. Um, And just there's so many resources out there and so many people who are doing it now. So don't be afraid to like see what other people are doing and talk to other people. Um, But ultimately, you have to be doing your own gut check. And there are some people that are just like, I could never do what you do. And I'm like, if you could never do it, don't do it. Right, right. Don't force this lifestyle on yourself. It's, yeah, it's not for everybody. But you know, find find your version of things, right? Like, I don't know, maybe it's, I need to have more camping in my life. So you buy a tent and you just get right. more deliberate about camping. <laughs> yes. Oh, that's such a great point. It's like, yeah, look, it's find your version of what this kind of freedom means to you. It doesn't have to be all or nothing. Again, I love that. That's a great, great tip. And if people do want to connect with me, as I mentioned, like I've been documenting my life and all of our travels were totally covered on our blog, including my musings about like, how am I going to make this happen? Like all of it is captured. So that's all at rossandjamieadventure.com. Amazing. Jamie, thank you so much. I loved this episode. Really loved it. I can't wait to re-listen to it and extract this for my own life. Even though I don't live in an RV, there's so many incredible nuggets of wisdom here that I think a lot of people are going to find uh, value in. So thank you for your time today. Thank you so much. It's really been a pleasure to speak with you. All right. That was a bundle of fun for me. I just love hearing about alternative lifestyles. It just doesn't just open up all these different possibilities for us and maybe things that we haven't considered before for ourselves. So, oh, by the way, Jamie forgot to share this with you guys. So I want to plug this for her. She has a free guide available at her website. So you can head over to rossandjamieadventure.com and you will find the four steps to your dream life blueprint that she offers. So you can grab that. And then just wrapping up with a quick update and Apple podcast review of the episode. So this episode with Jamie actually kicks off an entire series of subscriber stories that I'm doing. So if you missed it, go back a few episodes and tune into the mini episode we have. I think it's called want to be a guest on self helpless, pretty, pretty self explanatory. And it has all the submission instructions in there. But that's how Jamie got here. She wrote in about a few topics that she'd be happy to share. I've been wanting to do an episode about RV life for so long and boom, here she is. So I would love to hear from you. We are looking for a variety of insights and stories and experiences. You don't have to be famous. You don't have to be a New York Times bestselling author. You don't have to be an expert that's featured across a bunch of TV shows. Um, You just got to be you and not overthink the submission process. Everyone has something to share that can help other people. So please do not be overwhelmed by any 
you know, past guests and stuff that you've been thinking about or looking at um, that you think has different accolades than you do. That does not matter for this. I would also love to hear from you about, you know, as we move forward with these episodes, how are you liking the subscriber story episodes? I'm just, I'm really curious to hear your feedback because I've been loving these conversations so much. It really feels like I'm chatting with close friends. It's really cool. And it's just something that we've never tried on Self Helpless before to do this kind of series. So I would really love to hear uh, what you think of them, especially, I mean, so many of you have been around since the beginning and you've seen all the different transitions and all the uh, variety of guests that we've had. So anyway, anything that you want to share would be would be really awesome. You can also share that instruction submission episode with a friend if you know someone who you think would be a great guest. And also, if you have already submitted to be a guest, please know that we are still working through those submissions. We appreciate you applying so much. And if you get selected for an episode, you will hear from us directly via email in the next many weeks. Uh, We actually had to extend the amount of time needed for us to get back to you because we got a lot of submissions, which is awesome. Um, And the good news is I'm also extending the amount of episodes we're doing around subscriber stories because of the response and the amount of interest it's received. So thank you to everyone who's already written in. It's been incredible to learn about you. And lastly, the Apple podcast review for today is from Maddie0322.09. And it says, loved it. These podcasts are so great. It really helps to know that others are going through the same thing. Makes me feel less alone. I feel like I've got some valuable information out of this, which is always great. Altogether, worth listening to. Maddie, thank you for this review. I, I gotta say, doing this podcast makes me feel less alone too. When I get to have a meaningful conversation with someone um, that I would have never met otherwise, I, or I, you know, I learned something from a guest or a subscriber who writes in that opens something up for me and makes me feel uh, less stuck in my life that I can implement. And receiving reviews like this, it's just a really nice connection to have. So I'm really glad that's what you get from it because that's what it does for me too. So if you're tuning in and you want to leave a review that gets read on the next episode of Self Helpless, you can do that on your Apple Podcast app. And in exchange for you taking the time to do that, I take time on the podcast to personally thank you and say what's up. So what's up, Maddie? Hope you're having a lovely day. All right, everybody. uh, Talk to you soon and uh, freaking love you. Bye-bye. Thank you for tuning in to Self Helpless. You can find our brand new merch, Patreon community, and other fun goodies at selfhelplesspodcast.com. We'd be thrilled if you left an Apple podcast review, shared this episode with a friend, or post about it on Instagram and tag us at selfhelplesspodcast so we can repost you and say hi. As an independently produced show, we sincerely appreciate your support. Thanks, everybody.